Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for September 2nd, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest today on the Somerville School Committee Superintendent's Update is none other than Carrie Norman, the chair of the Somerville School Committee. Carrie Norman, first and foremost, it's been a while. It sure has. <laughs> it sure has. So, Carrie, how are you and the family been doing? We haven't seen each other in about a month. Uh, it has, uh, well, I have to say that I'm relying on calendars more and more because days and weeks and months are blurring. Uh, my oldest one uh, returned to Northeastern on Sunday, and I have to say I've never seen a more smooth operation within 45 minutes of pulling up. He had his third COVID test and was moved into his room and we were home. Uh, we miss him, uh, but I'm also, I'm happy that he's able to get back to some sense of normal. And then my 16 year old uh, starts in the high school, uh, it goes back in whatever form. And so we have continued to remind ourselves to assume the best about each other. And, and we have had more meals together in the backyard uh, with one or two friends than we have done in a long time. So that would be the silver lining of COVID at home. You, you are putting the, the happy face on that, but I happen to know that any parent, no matter what age their child is going back to school, um, has anxiety about it. Whether they are physically relocating to a dorm or going out of state or worried about their academic achievement going virtual. Um, yeah, so 100%. to all of the parents that are listening out there, m my thoughts go with you is that this is a trying time for everybody. Um, and you know, I, uh, Carrie, as you know, I have a very large family and, um, some of the nieces and nephews are married. They have kids of their own, <laughs> 16 at last count. Um, they're all faced with the same thing. Are the kids going back into a physical environment that is going to be safe? And if they're not going back, what's their achievement level going to look like going forward if they're doing virtual? So I know it's tough, but kudos yeah. to you, the school committee the parents, the students, everybody who is trying to figure this out. But first, as with anything else, Carrie, when you try to create a new model, you have to have some money to do that. So if you wanna give us a quick update on the final part of the budget for mm -hmm. Somerville School Committee, which is what you and all of your colleagues were working on the last time we spoke. School budget uh, for the coming months, years. Yes. So. Uh, I, the good news is that we did not have layoffs, that we held everyone, uh, we were able to keep everyone on the payroll through the spring, and I'm very proud of that, and we don't foresee any cuts now. Uh, I will say we were very purposeful in not asking for more money for the sake of money, but we uh, actually, school committee member Laura Patone initiated a, a, a resolution, a motion, I forget what the, we called it to be very clear with the city council and the mayor that as we sort out what the needs are actually going to be when we have a sense of the buildings, when we have a sense of who's going to be here, who's, what students have left, who has come in, what our real needs are going to be, uh, they should fully expect that we will be coming back to ask for more. But we wanted to, to be responsible and thoughtful about it with uh, you know taxpayer money. But um, that this is such an uncertain and rapidly changing time. We wanted to have the placeholder to be able to come back. So that's where we're at so far. It's funny you should ask because tonight at six is the first finance and facilities meeting of the summer uh, of the school year. Um, and uh, that chair, Andre Green, has asked for a full accounting of what was spent over the spring and over the summer to get us, uh, get us all caught up. So right. more to come. And there's more expenses to come, I would assume, because nobody has the answers about some of our older school facilities. Right. Um, you know, especially if, if, if uh, the system, meaning the city, the school committee, the superintendent, the parents, if everybody's in agreement as to what that timing actually looks like to bring them back into the physical facilities, some of our physical facilities are much older than yes. others may not be able to accommodate 
COVID requirements. And I'm thinking specifically, Gary, the Brown School. Because I was at the Brown School yesterday during election season, you know, my mind was whirling trying to figure out how do you accommodate bringing kids back into an ancient building that the windows may not open to create proper ventilation. So, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to solve it. I'm just saying there's part of the equation that everyone needs to figure out going forward. On top of that, the fact that we don't have a high school that's finished yet. So right. all of those things have to be worked out in the coming months. Good luck with it. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, well, I, I mean, it, it goes, it's much larger than that, right? We can talk about the lack of leadership in DC. I would say we need to talk about the lack of leadership coming from the state. So when we talk about the buildings, when, when districts are told to make the buildings safer without any metrics, any details, I mean, we are all uh, becoming environmental engineers and also, uh, you know, we are fortunate that in our city, the buildings are on the city side and the collaboration between the cities and the schools has been wonderful. We hired a, an engineering firm that went through not just each building, but each space within each building. And so um, we haven't gotten the full report from them, some preliminary. I mean, as you can expect, some of the buildings are older, some are newer. Um, but we need to, do people need to get very flexible in their thinking because there might be parts of a building that we will be able to use and other parts that we will not be able to use. Uh, and with the reopening plan, it is a phased in putting a priority on some of the, the students who are at least able to access remote education. Our younger students, right, they're, they're learning language. They, they shouldn't be in front of screens for hours and hours. There's a lot of our special ed um, services and programming that can't be done remotely or can partially be done are English language learners. And then we have some students who just haven't been able to access it remotely right. uh, for a host of reasons. You know, both parents may be working. So first it's a health crisis, right? And so we need to evaluate the buildings. We need to have consistent and robust surveillance testing in place before we will talk about a date to go back to the buildings. And then that will look like, what that will look like um, I think people need to not have the idea that I'm in this classroom with these 22 kids and this is my teacher. Yeah, what we've learned from COVID be, is- Carrie, it's gonna be about flexibility and mobility. And patience, and yes. Patience. Yep. Um, so that's absolutely. a good way talking about patience. Um, you know, the, the parents, teachers, students, and staff were all patient, trying to figure out um, when the reopening would be. Yes. And correct me if I have the date wrong, September 21st is the magic date? September 18th. September. So, so our, our educators, uh, they all reported in on, on Monday of this week. Typically, uh, actually the students would have come back today. And uh, so what DESE, Department of Education, Elementary and Secondary Education, has given all the districts an extra 10 days uh, for PD and orientation so instead of having 180 days it's now 170 days of instruction right. so we added those 10 days so we will be going back on friday the 18th and i have been made well aware that friday is not a great day to go back it's how the numbers uh the dates fell out but i would also say i think that we can all anticipate that will be a day of learning how to log on and um working on a lot of the logistical kinks so let me, um, you know, before we start talking about the mechanics of who's going to be doing what, in full disclosure, the Somerville Media Center is in discussion with the Somerville Public School System about how we can assist going forward uh, with not so much instructional, but with tech support, um, uh, helplines, um, scheduling, a lot of that stuff we are in negotiation with the school committee to talk about uh, school system. Yeah. I shouldn't say it. it's you guys. It's the school system to see how we can be utilized in assisting the education system going forward. For that, we're deeply grateful. But it's also it goes far beyond that. You're you're being modest. Um, it's also doing innovative programming remotely, whether um, being able to send home camera equipment. Our kids. All people need interaction. Kids, they are, 
social animals and it can look different for different kids, but everyone needs some kind of human contact uh, and connection. And the media center, in addition to other community partners have been talking about reinventing what it is. Uh, this summer you served, your organization served, I don't know how many students. And we have close to 350 kids, yeah. And that's, that's so important. It's so important that they have contact and interaction with each other, uh, with adults outside of their home, with role models, and to also keep that curiosity about learning going. And so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, it's um, during the time of trial and crisis, I, it's amazing to how innovative people can get. So uh, we look forward to continuing the partnership. I haven't got an answer for anybody yet. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that works out, but we're excited about it. So yes. let's go into the reopening plan, September 18th. We are going all virtual for the mm -hmm. remainder of this fall session. Is that correct? Uh, there it has, so we're, I'm gonna be careful. Uh, so we have been negotiating very intensely with our all of our unions, especially our teachers unions twice a week. Uh, yesterday was a, a significant and concluding negotiation. So right now the, the and I know teach, families are very anxious to get the schedules. Anytime there's a change in work conditions, it needs to be bargained. So currently the STA has, I believe the ratification vote will be Thursday. And then the school committee is scheduled to meet, I think it's our second or third, 8.30 in the morning meeting on Friday to vote on that. And once that all of those, those important steps have been taken, then we will have the schedules to be able to send out to families. I can give you a broad idea that it will not look the same. Well, Go ahead. You know, being respectful of, of how you have to negotiate with the unions, I don't want to ask you for too many details, but I think people are looking for what is the date? So next week you'll be able to announce how this whole thing is going to be phased in starting September 8th. Um, well, we know we'll be remote. I mean, so here's the tricky thing, and I'm not trying to be elusive. Um, I just, I've seen other districts make declarations where they haven't negotiated with their teachers and having to walk it back, where they haven't done the, the research in, in the other buildings. And, and all of those factors are in play here. Uh, and so I, I believe strongly in the spirit of transparency, I'm not gonna commit to something that I, I don't know is if we can hold to. So I will talk a lot about the, var the variables in play. What I will say is that it will look, so the 18th is when it will start. Um, I, I think you can look through the fall. I mean, a lot of it's also gonna depend on what the virus is doing, because first and foremost, this is a, a health crisis. And, and what we, without having leadership and coordination at the state level, it's, it's trying to be diplomatic. I, I take comfort that we are being you're as talking, cautious. Gary, you're talking to Joe Lynch. Okay. We, we don't have to be diplomatic with okay. him. So what I'm gonna say is I'm glad that in Somerville we are being as cautious as we are and we have to be very aware that we are in a dense metropolitan area where a number of our abutting districts are in the red. And, and it's, we don't have walls around Somerville, right? We have teachers, we have educators, we have people who move back and forth between the districts readily. Um, and so- I would assume, especially among the teacher um, cohort, right? Yeah. Yeah. You have teachers who do not live in Somerville. Uh, 100%. Right. Uh, and I will say some of the local superintendents and mayors have had some preliminary discussions. Is there any way to coordinate the remote uh, when some teachers will be on and off? Because it's, it's very common that you will have uh, a teacher will live in Cambridge and teaches in Somerville or someone lives in Somerville and they're teaching in Medford. And so here's the thing about schools is that we are the largest child care providers and and we need to so there's I'm very aware of that uh, it's difficult for our educators and it's difficult for all of our families I mean there isn't anyone who hasn't had their life changed in significant ways right right whether or not they've had COVID or known someone with COVID all of our lives have changed so let me ask you, I mean, this is not a sandbagging question, but let me ask you your initial impression about the unions when 
there wasn't a agreement between, not Somerville, I'm talking about other, other districts, where there was not an agreement between the, um, either the school committee or the town manager or the, the, the school system with the educators themselves. And the educators kind of felt like they had been locked out of the, the uh, conversation where the school system just came out and said, this is the opening date, you're all going back into the physical facilities. And then through their unions, they just boycotted it and said, we're not going back in. And they I, I, outside. I mean, it doesn't sound to me, Carrie, like we have that in Somerville. Um, no, our educators, I mean, we have been negotiating and, and working with them and the leaders of the STA with the leaders in the central office have been uh, countless hours. I, I mean, there hasn't been a summer. Uh, and when people, if they have gone away, are still logging in and zooming in, it, it is um, our family liaisons. We made them full time at the in June and they have been working so hard all summer. I mean, it has really been a community effort. What I will say that is difficult about the plans is that I don't think there's a school committee or a superintendent who didn't realize that they needed to negotiate and impact bargain. I think plans get announced and all of us are so ready for some sense of certainty that I think the public is rightly so, okay, this is the plan. All right, now I got it. Um, and it's, it's just not that way. Uh, and we, uh, I am a little cranky with the state. I can say this, you know, I, there has been no organization. And when I say that, I mean, one example would be all of the school plans were due the 10th. We hadn't, a lot of the contracts hadn't been started to negotiate. The commissioner, Jeff Riley, who I, I have had a lot of respect for, didn't meet with any of the school committee member until the next day. I mean, the deadline got pushed. And then it was the day after the plans were due that you suddenly got the red green uh, maps from the, the governor, which is one data point and is not, I don't think a responsible way to, to create a plan. But when I say that the state has not given any guidance, uh, that would be an example. Or last Friday announcing, uh, it, with good intentions, I think to have more, to open up where st students can go uh, to do remote learning. The Friday before that annou surprise announcement is suddenly they're announcing that they want teachers teaching from empty classrooms, even if they're remote uh, and no students are there. And there's a host of reasons why that there's- Carrie, let, in... let me see if I understand it. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. My point is, is that it has been, there's so many variables. The Secretary of Education comes up with a plan announces the plan in conjunction with the governor and doesn't coordinate with the school districts and just announces. Is that He didn't that? even come up with the plan. He just said, you will need to come up with a plan. Here are the three things. We didn't know when we were coming up with this, we didn't know which of the remote. So the state has contract uh, licensed several um, different, if you want to do purely online, if you have a lot of support or there's reasons in your, for your family, that makes sense. We didn't get those until way down in the process, right, right? right? We knew in March, we knew this was not looking good. If the state had been able to start saying, here's some of the licensing we're gonna secure now. Here's some of, uh, you know, we're gonna start buying tents in bulk so you can do outdoor classrooms. We're gonna do the, the, the research on that for you. Instead, you have every district competing with each other uh, to order tents so that we can do as much outdoors as we can to get access to as many students as we can in a safe way. It has been, uh, we're all competing for the same engineers uh, and oh, some schools it. are doing less research than others. No, I got it. it it's Chaos. Leadership, leadership from the top. It's leadership it's been from a, the top. It's a, a really poor use of resources in both time and money at a local level. But it does sound like the Somerville School Committee, the superintendent's office, the unions, the mayor, Everybody's working in concert yes. these days to figure out, A, yes. how do we accommodate the best teaching environment first for the kids yeah. and the teachers and the staff, and you cannot leave out the piece of parents need to go back to work as well. How do we take care of the youngest among them, yeah. child care systems, 
feeding the kids during the day, feeding kids on weekends. I mean, this is not going to be easy. And, and I like what you said earlier, is that the school systems have turned into almost full envelope child care systems from the time that the parent goes to work till the time the parent comes home at night. I mean, I, I, I see it. I see it in my own family. I see it in my neighbors, you know, two working parents. You gotta be there for the kids. You gotta pick them up at a certain time after school programs. You gotta get them dropped off for the breakfast in the morning. That piece of it, I think, is what a lot of us who do not have children, who do not have that responsibility, I think a lot of times we miss that point of it. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, we went out on a Wednesday. We started grab and go meals uh, on that Monday. And we have continued it through the summer on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, with backpacks of food on Friday to get families through the weekend as best we can. I mean, it, I would say the Somerville community has come together in ways, uh, the beautiful project, which collected art supplies, it has become the diaper distribution center. Uh, so families can get free diapers. It has, uh, your organization has stepped up. So many people have stepped up in ways that with the, well, I'll just be, I mean, I have been really moved and touched and terrified, uh, all of those things. I, I got a letter, you, you referenced it earlier, how parents are doing. Uh, there's a, a parent who is often quick to criticize uh, and comment and suggest. And I got an email from her and she just said, Carrie, here's the thing. I see all these meetings and I go to them and you're at all of them and thank you, but I'm really, really scared. And I thought, well, there you go, right? I can work with that. And that is, uh, even the, the frustrated, blustery letters, I think it comes out of a place of parents wanting the best for their kids and feeling the pressure of work and childcare and uncertainty and, uh, you know, and Carrie, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know that goes on behind the scenes. You know? mm. We don't know that about their financial security. Exactly. We, you know, people exactly. aren't going to volunteer. Hey, we're both out of work. We're living on a, on you know handouts. I mean, people. Those are very yeah. personal things for people to talk about. So I think all of us who are in leadership positions, all of us who are trying to figure this out for the different organizations that yeah. we're associated with, whether it's elected or volunteer or any of this, you know, I'm trying to be extremely sensitive that yeah. I don't know everything about that person's personal life. So kudos to the school committee, unions, teachers, superintendent, city. The city, our partners. I, I, I take your comment to heart, Joe. I, my family, um, our fine, it was tight. And we were often the family that got the big basket at Thanksgiving from the church yeah. and you know that your neighbors all voted you like the most desperate family and they probably felt a lot better about that basket than I did. Um, I think the respect and the privacy. So there is, um, I know some people are wondering, well, I don't really see it. Uh, there is a lot of things that are getting done and, and families, privacy, dignity, um, healthcare. It's, it, we need to be respectful of that. Uh, it got a friend of mine who's a family liaison. I mean, these are the moments where I realize how extensive it is, right? She, minivan, she opened up the back of it in the back of her mini, it's like a mobile unit, right? Yeah. She's got diapers, disinfecting wipe, shelf stable milk, cereal, uh, market basket cards that people have donated. And to, I mean, it, it is, um, is it enough? Is it all, are all the needs being met? No, but I, I, I think we're farther along than most. Then let's um, let's try to recap a little bit, and then I, I want to give you some time at the towards the end of this to recap yourself. September eighteenth, even though it's a Friday, not optimal. You're going to restart. It is going virtual. Maybe next week after conclusion with the unions and ratifying, we can have a little bit more information. Uh, maybe next week or the week after about what this is going to look like going right through probably December. Um, no layoffs, um, which I think everyone deserves credit for that. We're keeping yeah, people. I mean, at, to this point, we haven't. I mean, I, I'm going to be careful about, I can't promise the future. I don't, there's none no, scheduled. 
Uh, yeah. I have to say the FY22 budget scares me to no end, but we can have that conversation another day. But we're hoping that the Commonwealth and the federal government is going to come up with a package that says, we understand you're hurt, we understand you need, here's a bucket full of money, continue on. Right, I know, I know, we're all looking for that, Kerry. We're all looking for that. Reopening, though, um, it sounds like things are on track. It doesn't sound like we're going to have, these are my words, not yeah. yours. We're not going to have... Um, childlike behavior from the adults moving forward that we are going to keep our eye on the prize which is the education of the kids yes and what i can say is the spring uh, remote learning was in response to a crisis uh, what is planned for the fall is significantly more robust the amount of pd professional development that happened last spring and over the summer and will continue on we have learned a huge amount our educators uh, have are working in teams that uh, reconfigured in ways that we didn't it, we hadn't done before. The creativity and the dedication is huge. I, I mean, it's it will. Be, there is no great way forward. Let's be honest, right? There is no magic pathway. Uh, is it going to be better than the spring? Yes, and we are going to keep working to make it. Uh, as best we can and to keep going with that and that said though it's it's going to be really important for families to stay in contact if things aren't going right if there are needs to be met you don't understand all of the lingo of what's the remote or what's the learning management system please call your principals call your teachers call your school committee members call the central office um, we understand that the, this is all new and for those of us who have been in the weeds, I am more than happy to spend as much time as we need to, to to make sure people understand it. We've also done a number of town hall meetings, translated both uh, with a focus on special education and also reopening. Uh, we are trying to reach out in as many different ways to all of our families as we possibly can. That's Carrie Norman, chair of the Somerville Public Schools, uh, sorry, chair of the Somerville <laughs> School Committee. Yes. Working hard as always. Carrie, we're out of time, but you want to come back anytime. You know that. You have a stand. I, I love it. There's going to be more news week to week, so we will be back soon. Standing invitation. Thanks for All joining right, Joe. us. For Thank you. For the Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. My guest has been Carrie Norman, chair of the Somerville School Committee. Until next time, stay safe, stay informed. See you then.